Good morning, Kensington. So good to see you guys this morning. Welcome to all of you that are joining us online. So glad you're here. Hey, if you can, would you stand up with me? We're gonna sing this song together as we start today. That's a great song to start with. I love the sentiment that it actually sends out to us. This idea that when you enter the Father's house, there's no shame. Just check your shame at the door. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know what's on your shoulders. I don't know what's weighing you down. But my hope is by the end of our time together, we've checked it at the door and that you have a different vision of what God really sees and how he wants you to see. So that, that's really uh, just a great way to start out. Now, 
Uh, Troy, we're at Troy campus right now. If you're joining us online, uh, we're the featured campus this week for all of Kensington. And so we just wanna welcome all of you, whether you're from Traverse City or you're joining us from Orion or Clinton Township or Clarkston or Birmingham, we just wanna say, hey, we love you guys. We're one church from multiple locations and we always say hi to them. So on the count of three, let's say hi to our community online. One, two, three. So we are so glad that you are with us. Well, this morning, I got a picture from Andrew Kim and uh, he is out running, here it is. Uh, that was at about 5.30 when I was up this morning, he clicked it, so here it is. Here's the guy, he said, I don't know if you know this, but we have a number of people running uh, the marathon in Detroit and Andrew's doing a half marathon. He said, by the time I do the greeting last service, he would be in agony, crying, probably saying words he shouldn't say, asking for forgiveness, crossing the finish line. So there you have it. Uh, he did a half marathon, but hey, I'll tell you something. It's beautiful that we get to run for strangers, essentially. They're our family. We have connections in the Pokot tribe in Africa. They're part of our, our, our family, but many times we'll never be able to meet them. But you have people, hundreds of people that are saying, I'm gonna run this marathon and raise money so that you will have clean water in your community. And what a gift that has been. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you. Uh, is there any runners in here from this morning just by chance? Sometimes they'll come back. No, they're still running. All right, you know, you, you didn't win. But anyway, but we're so grateful that you're here, grateful that you're online. And uh, this season, how many can tell me how many days before Christmas? It's really close, just so you know. <laughs> it's, it's less than 100. And so we are getting close to that. We know that as we move into this season, as the weather starts to shift, we have one of our great opportunities that has become a tradition for us, which is Thanksgiving baskets. And this community gets to be the hands and feet of really reaching out to our broader community, our broader region, and be able to come together as a community and serve our community, be able to give uh, people that may not have the resources or the ability to celebrate Thanksgiving or have anything for Thanksgiving, we get to pour into that. And so I'm inviting you on that journey. Uh, you might, this might be your first day or you've been here for 30 years, but we did, we've done this a long time, over two decades. And so you can get, go to kensingtchurch.org uh, slash Thanksgiving. You can go out in the lobby here uh, if you're here in, in person and go out there and just talk and find out the details. You can invest financially. You can help us put them together. You can even help deliver them. And so we'd love to, to, to bring you into that tradition. So grateful that you're here. Well, we are in the second week of this season called Reveal, or this series called Reveal. And it, the re, this, this series grew out of a book I was reading by a guy named Adam Hamilton. He was a, a priest on the west side of the state or a, a country. And he was looking at phrases, cultural phrases that we have, that we hold on to, that many times we'll attribute to the Bible, but are they really in the Bible? And what do they really mean? And is it a partial truth or is it a whole truth or is it not true at all? And does it exist in the scripture? So last week I thought Angie did a great job bumping us into the series and looking at the Bible as a whole. What does that mean? And today we're gonna look at one phrase that many, many of you have probably heard and if not all of you have heard, and I'm not gonna tell it to you yet, but we're gonna move into this in just a moment. But just like last week, we wanted to move into this series and move into these days uh, with a certain posture. And so we, we sang a song, I believe last week called Make Room. It's this idea, Lord, would you make room in my heart right now? Would you make room in my mind? Uh, and, and here's what I want you to know. Today you woke up and you decided to come here. Some of you came here physically, many of you come here, I mean, thousands of you online. You turned on your computer, you got in your car and you showed up. You know what you're doing? You're making room. You're making a slot of time in your life and you're saying, this is valuable. I want to go here for whatever reason. Now, some of you might've been dragged here because they're promising you lunch. That's fine. Some of you don't even know why you're here. You just need something that's fantastic. Some of you are, are, are coming here because you do this every week. But I'm telling you, these moments in our culture can be rare where you say, I'm coming, Lord, because I want to hear from God. I wanna hear from our community. I wanna experience one. I wanna make room. You just made room. You made the decision. And so we wanna sing this song over you and say, Lord, make room in my heart, in my soul, in my mind. And I'm praying that God speaks to us individually, but I also pray that he always speaks to us collectively as a movement, as a church rooted in the truth of Jesus. So let's take this song in and then we'll keep moving.
Lord, we ask for that posture of our hearts. That's a dangerous prayer, actually. A dangerous prayer with you, Lord, to say, I make room. I make room. We make room as a community. We make room individually. We're asking you, Lord, uh, to enter into this. You're here, uh, uh, but we really want to have this posture to say, Lord, speak. Uh, Lord, this morning we also pray for our brothers and sisters in Haiti, especially the missionaries that have been taken and kidnapped and children too. Lord, we, we, we pray for all followers of Christ around the world that don't have the privilege all the time to do what we're doing right now, so freely gather. And so we, we thank you for the freedom, but we also ask for solidarity across this world of Christ followers, that we are making room, we are a family, we're a community that's following you, Lord, and we wanna hear from you. And when we hear from you, Lord, it's never neutral. You always change, you're morphing, you're, you're changing us into more and more and more of who you are. And so we want that, we desire that for our community. I desire that deeply for our community and for myself. So Lord, um, make sure that my words are your words. If they're not, would you just burn them up and throw them away? Uh, but would you let all that is of you be tattooed on our heart, minds, and soul? We pray this in Jesus' name, and we say, amen. Well, we're going to, uh, at the end of the service, take communion. So I just want to give you a heads up there, and especially those that are watching online. You know, uh, Craig Mays, who's a great teacher, he's our interim leader over at Clinton Township. He said, in, in the ancient world, uh, people would just use their, you know, just normal household products to take communion. You know, whatever you have, you have crackers, you have bread, you have whatever you have, water. Uh, so if you want to just know that that's coming up uh, in about a half hour or so, we'd love you to, to get ready for that. And we'll pass that here so you don't have anything to worry about here. Well, as I started thinking about this particular day, I started thinking about moments in my life where I've gotten into situations where I've stuck. Maybe something's happened and I can't quite move. Maybe you're there today and... I started thinking about funny moments. And when I was a kid, uh, you know, you always try to jump the fence without your feet touching. You know, you kind of go all the way over. And I thought I was really cool and I could do that. And I went to do that and the fence caught my pants and I was just hanging there, you know. I just want to let you know, number one, it's painful. But number two, you can't do anything unless someone comes and rescues you, right? I don't know if you knew that. So I, I thought it would be kind of fun just to Google that and see what images would come up. And maybe some of these spark uh, images in your mind. But here's the first one that I saw. And maybe you've had this happen. You know, I, I think they had to bring the jaws of life to get her out of that a moment. Or maybe one of your kids has done this. That's me on the fence. That's what happened. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I must be oddball, but I laughed so hard at that. I can just imagine what she's saying. Mom, help. You know, I was trying to get cookies and I fell off here or whatever. Or this one, of course. Uh, that happened to me as, as an adult, but we can't talk about that. So, uh, but yeah, the, and then the last one. There you go. Uh, you know I'm such a big cat fan if you know me well. Uh, no, I'm not. But anyway, so, uh, but that, I think that's so hilarious. But I, I thought those images were so funny. Have you ever found yourself in those kinds of positions? And sometimes, I mean, those are funny. But many times, it's not so funny. On August 5th, 2010, in San Jose Copper Mines in Chile, there was an explosion. And it said the explosion was caused by a part of the mountain, a stone that was the size of the Empire State Building, 45 things that actually weighed twice as much as the Empire State Building. And it cut off from the mountain and fell into the copper mine all the way down to where it rested. And when it rested, it blocked the way out for 33 Chilean miners. They were entombed in this small space. In fact, one of the miners said, when that fell and that stone came crashing down, it was as if it was the tomb of Jesus being rolled or, or the stone of Jesus being rolled over the tomb. They knew there was no way out. They were caught in this tiny little room. It was dark. It was hot, 95 degrees, very few rations. And they were nearly 2,000 feet below the surface of the earth. They didn't have an ability to get themselves out. It looked like a hopeless situation and there was no really hope in sight. Now, have you ever had those kinds of experiences? I'm assuming in this room that there's not minors. I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't assume. Maybe some of you are minors in here. I know actually in our family, we have a minor. My, my brother-in-law, John, is, lives up in the UP and he's a minor. So John and Jill, if you're watching, we love you. You're awesome. But, uh, but you don't see that very often. And so more than likely, we're not going to be trapped 2,000 feet underneath the surface of the earth. But have you been in situations in your life, I know I have, where it feels that way? 
Situations where you get a diagnosis or a surgery or job loss or financial loss or relationship issues or homelessness, isolation, loneliness, addictions, mental illness, anxiety, violence, abusive situations. And it feels like we're trapped underneath the very surface of our lives and there's no way out. And so this story of the miners, this, this image of being trapped underneath there really plays into our day today. Years ago, there was a talk show and they would go out on the streets and uh, they would ask people questions, you know, simple questions like, who's the president or who's the secretary of state? And the, and the answers were hilarious and they're kind of sad because they never really knew simple answers. But one night they went out and they asked the people on the streets, what are the 10 commandments? Can you say some of the 10 commandments? And the answer that kept coming up regularly was, God helps those who help themselves. They thought it was one of the Ten Commandments, or at least they thought it was a big message or a big part of Scripture. And they're not alone in that. Barna, this polling group that looks at, a Christian polling group that looks at people all the time, they found that over 80% of Americans believe that God helps those who help themselves is a theme and a very scriptural theme that runs throughout Scripture in the Bible. Does it? Does God help those who help themselves? Is it true? Is it in the scripture? Is it partially true? Is it half true? Or is it possible that there's a whole nother paradigm that we can find by looking at that particular phrase? We're gonna show you a video in a minute, but in my childhood when I grew up in my neighbor, particular neighborhood, it was a monocultural neighborhood. And many times when we use that phrase, God helps those who help themselves, or it would always be added to uh, people need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So it's this combination of these two. It was always kind of looking at other people and saying they're lazy. They need to pull themselves up. They need to make something of their life. But is that really how God sees us? And is it perhaps that God has something way bigger? And is it perhaps that by the end of today, all of us will be drawn into a real deep truth that scripture does teach? I think it is true. First, we wanna watch a video. We're gonna have Andrea Gibbs walk us through maybe the historical context of where this phrase comes from. And then we're gonna jump into some scripture and ideas that hopefully by the end, will actually really lift us much higher than we even walked in as. Let's watch this. All right, I'm gonna say a phrase. Let's see if this sounds familiar to you. God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard it? I bet you have. Now, where in the Bible can we find this phrase? L let's see, maybe it's in the Old Testament. I'm sure Moses, David, Abraham, or one of the lesser known prophets would have said this. Nothing? Okay, let's try the New Testament. I'm sure Paul said this in one of his great teachings or letters. Or maybe Jesus himself said this in one of his sermons or when he was having one of those tough conversations with his disciples. Having a hard time finding it? Okay, maybe if we do a Google search, it will show us where in the Bible this phrase shows up. Still no luck? That's weird. If it's not in the Bible, then where in the world did this popular phrase come from? Back to Google. I mean, where else do we go for information? If you were to type in, God helps those who help themselves, one of the first people to show up is, believe it or not, Benjamin Franklin. The same Benjamin Franklin who helped draft the Declaration of Independence, invented the lightning rod, bifocals, and swim fins, yes, swim fins, is credited for this popular phrase. Ben Franklin, under the pseudonym of Richard Saunders, published the first infamous Poor Richard's Almanac in 1733. In the 1757 edition, we find this often used phrase and the context in which it was used, taxes. But Ben, Poor Richard isn't the first person to use this phrase, shame on you. If you were to really nerd out and do some deeper diving, you would find that Aesop, a Greek storyteller who died in 564 BC, used this phrase in his fable, Hercules and the Wagoner, a story about a wagoner whose heavy load was stuck in the mud and cried out to Hercules for help. Here is Hercules' response. Get up and put your shoulder to the wheel. The gods help them who help themselves. Side note, this was around the same time that Daniel found himself in a lion's den. I wonder how Daniel would have taken this advice being thrown in a dark pit surrounded by starving lions. Come on, Daniel, what's wrong with you? Do your part. Doesn't make a lot of sense. So. God helps those who help themselves is nowhere to be found in the Bible, nowhere. But some polls say that 82% of Americans believe it's an actual Bible verse. So how has this phrase shaped our culture? And what does the Bible actually say about God helping us? 
It's fascinating when you think about culture, when you think about all that you've grown up in, there's sayings that you never really research. Like, I, I didn't research that saying. I just knew that saying because it was passed down. Think about all the sayings that you might have in your mind or in your heart or even things that you live out that you never really understand. It just was given to you when you were young and you just start to take it as what it is. And so some of those can have profound influence. And there's a reason why these cultural phrases exist. Because many times, usually there is just a bit of truth in them. Maybe there is half truth in them. This phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is partially true. It points to an important aspect of our life. The fact of the matter is, we should all do everything we can to help ourselves when we're in certain situations. Of course, followers of Christ, and if you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, and this is, this is you coming today to say, hey, this is the, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ. I, I want to uh, learn. I want to go out. I'm going to live this out. That's beautiful, and I'm so grateful you're here. If you're here exploring, we're grateful that you're here as well. This is a great message for you to hear. I don't know where you are in your faith journey, but as followers of Christ, we know we're called to pray. In fact, we're called to pray in everything all the time in every situation, and we're called to pray to God and to have faith in God. And that's just part of how we're going to live. But there is circumstances where we all need to do our work. Not only pray, but work. Think about it. You lose your job, and if you're not going to go out and you're not going to network and you're not going to update your resume, and you're not going to search for a new job, and you're going to sit and pray and say, Lord, help me, you may not get much. If the doctor is telling you that you have to change your lifestyle because you're dealing with a lot of health issues and you just pray to God and say, okay, God, take care of them, he may. I've seen miraculous things. But if you don't do your work, guess what? More than likely, your health is gonna decline. If you have a marriage, maybe you walked in today and your marriage is in hard shape and I'll just speak to the men in here. This was my situation years ago. And my wife is asking me to go to therapy and I'm saying, no, I'm good. And I found out much later I wasn't so good. But I wouldn't do that work. It wasn't until I stepped in and actually started to do the work that I really became in this partnership with God and our marriage started to get some life. And so there's part of this that we do have work to do. And the apostle Paul spoke about this. He spoke to a small church plant that he started. He said it this way. For even when we were with you, this church community, we gave you this command. It wasn't even a suggestion. He gave this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Anyone know a busybody? <laughs> but mere busybodies. I remember years ago, I was, uh, and I, it took a number of mission trips to my daughter's hometown of Honduras. And we went with these amazing missionaries from a place uh, in Texas called Mercy Ships. And they just became our mentors. They were missionaries for over 60 years. And they were harsh about this. One time we were out there, and, no, and one, a couple of people weren't working, and they're like, uh, guess what? When you get home today, you're not eating. And they're like, what? And he goes, scripture's very clear. You don't work, you don't eat. And they held to it. They was like, it was hardcore, you know? But what is Paul saying? He's like, hey, there is work to do. There is work that we need to do, that we need to actually do these things. So God helps them selves has some truth to it, meaning we have work to do. We have an active part in our lives. There's a Benedictine phrase that the monks commonly use and it's, it's called ora et labor. It means pray and work. Pray and work. And they mean this is has kind of holistic, spiritual, physical, mental health. was based on this idea that we pray and we have faith, but we come alongside and we work. So there's kernels of truth in this. We pray and we work. We're called to step in. We're called as people of God to step in and do the work. I like what Adam Hamilton says from the book Half Truths. He says, we don't sit around waiting for God to miraculously right the wrongs in society. As scripture reveals over and over and over again, God works through people. We are the instruments of God that he uses to change the world. And you see this historically throughout the Christian faith. Even in the mid-1950s, where there was the Montgomery bus boycott, led, of course, by Rosa Parks, who wouldn't give up her seat on December 1st, 1955, there was all kinds of work that was happening behind the scenes by primarily the women of the church, black women of the church, that were fighting against the segregation in that town. And they were praying feverishly. They were praying feverishly. They were incredible people of faith, but they were putting their hands to the power and working against this. 
And when it got to that moment on December 1st, 1955, it all came to, to, to fruition. And that's what perpetuated the civil rights movement and moved into all the things that had happened after that. There is work to do. But sometimes this phrase can be used as a way of avoiding helping those around us that truly cannot help themselves. People just need to pick themselves up by the bootstraps. If you know around that same time, Martin Luther King had a very famous saying. He said it this way. It's all right to tell a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps, but it is cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. There are people that don't have boots that were saying, lift yourself up by your bootstraps. And Martin Luther King says, that's cruel. The community of God has a role in that. There are people that are in such a deep hole of life that they have no ability to fully lift themselves up. The miners in Chile, 2,000 feet below the surface of the earth in a small little place had nothing to pick themselves up. They're not gonna find their way to the surface. They had no ability in a community of people around the world, there are communities and individuals that are, can't do that. And guess what? God's calls his, God calls his community into this kind of work. So maybe our phrase today can be now starting to shift. Maybe our phrase isn't so much God helps those who help themselves, but why don't we take the phrase and just turn it and say, God helps those who cannot help themselves. And I'm gonna reverse this message a little bit. If it was a very logical message, I would probably do this in a different order, but I'm not. Because there's a point to it. And I'm hoping it makes it when we get to the end of this message. But there's only two pathways that I want you to see this with. There's a number of others, but only two pathways that I want you to see for our purposes today. God helps those who cannot help themselves through his people and by his grace. Say through his people. People online and here, say it again, through his people. And by his grace, through his people, and by his grace. And we're going to look at a passage in the New Testament in Matthew 25 to start. And the first one is God helps those who cannot help himself through his people. Now, just before this passage, it's good for you to understand that there was three parables stacked on each other. The first parable talks about heaven. And the image of heaven. The next parable talks about the talents that God gives human beings and the expectation that God has for what he's given you. Now, here's what I want you to hear today. Every single person in this room on stream that will ever hear my voice on this message, that you have been given something that is unique to you that God wants to use to impact the world. Many people say, no, I don't have anything. I'm not talking about doing something great in your mind, meaning, oh, I've got to change the world. I've got to be the next whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is God has given you something and he wants to take that and he wants to take your life and he wants you to impact the surrounding people that you have around you and the community you have around you. And sometimes we forget that. And so he talks about the importance of that and what we're supposed to do with God, what God has given us. And then he moves into this parable or even vision that he lays out for his disciples that are listening, for his followers, and for the community that is listening to him at this time. And this is called the judgment of the nations. And what it means when he says nations is the judgment of Gentiles, meaning God had a chosen people, Jews, and everyone else the Gentiles. And this is speaking to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Us, primarily, if you're not Jewish and you're not part of that, it's us. And so God is speaking to us today through this particular story. Matthew 25. When the Son of God comes in his glory, because we believe that God is going to come in judgment, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the goats on his left. Now, in ancient culture, here's some of the background that I just want you to imagine with me, because he's speaking to a particular culture at this time. And they're listening through the cultural ears. And they know something in that culture. In ancient culture, the right side is the seat of honor. The left side is lesser than. And so they're listening to this and they're saying the right side is the seat of honor in that culture. And the sheep are on the right. And the goats will be put on the left. Sheep in that culture were considered more valuable than goats, even though goats had value. So they were considered more valuable. They were more plentiful 
They were in greater numbers. And sheep had the reputation of being obedient. And you knew that there was a thread that went through scripture that said that God is the great shepherd and his people are his, say it, the people are his, the sheep. Why? Because when sheep would know the shepherd's voice. When the shepherd yelled for them, they would understand his voice. They could pick it out in a number of different voices and they would follow. And so this culture knew what was happening. Interesting enough in this culture, at night, the shepherd would take the sheep and the goats and they would separate them at night because the sheep had a particular preference and so did the goats and they would separate them. So this culture, they're seeing all of these things and they're understanding what, God, what, what uh, Jesus is saying in this particular parable. So people are listening and they understand that the sheep are God's people. They're doing God's work. They're being honored at his right hand and they're being separated as a shepherd would. And then Jesus says this. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous people that are right with God, that are being honored on the right hand. So the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and then invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? Or when did, you, when did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And the king replied this, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the very least of these brothers and sisters, you have done for me. And then it goes on to say that the goats on the left did not inherit this. They did not do this work. They did not inherit this kingdom. They did not take their inheritance. I think it's significant to note that the righteous, the people that were in right relationship with God, who were following God, didn't even realize that they were doing the work that was required in the kingdom. They had no realization that when how, where, when did they do these things, Lord? Now, I imagine that the disciples, people that have walked with Jesus are around him. I imagine that there are greater numbers, but I imagine his close disciples listening to this and hearing this in a different way. They have to be listening and saying, wait a minute, this is the work we do. You gotta remember that Jesus was going from town to town to town. He was going to the most vulnerable. He was going to the marginalized. He was speaking into ones that were sick, spiritually, mentally, physically, and he was providing healing. He was seeing transformation. They're seeing restoration. They're doing the work. And they're hearing this and saying, this is kingdom work. This is actually work that has eternal value. This is an inheritance that I can feel here now on earth, but for eternity. They had to have been this unbelievable awakening for them. And this seems to be a natural overflow for people of God, meaning they don't realize they're doing it. They're just doing it. So much so that these righteous people didn't realize they saying, this is something special. This is even core to the kingdom. A community that is rooted in the mercy and the love of Christ reach out to other communities that are incapable of caring for themselves. And the community of God, part of the kingdom work is to come around people who cannot help themselves. And when we show kindness and we show mercy and compassion to people, we are showing kindness and mercy and compassion to Christ, that there is an interlinking between Christ's creation as people and himself. When I care for you, in a way that's sacrificial, I'm caring for Christ. When I'm caring for you or you're caring for me, you're caring for Christ. It's this interlocking thing that God wants us to see. And when we are truly moved and rooted in following Christ as people, we cannot help but help those who cannot help themselves. We are a people of mercy. You know, a few, few weeks ago, I, I, shared a, an e I read an email from a single mom 
that was struggling really bad and she happened to send me this email. It was really moving. If you weren't here, it was this incredible email that linked so perfectly with the day. I wasn't reading the email so much. I didn't ask for anything. I just read it over us and, and she came to this incredible spiritual truth of having peace in a time that was so difficult for her. And she was having real physical issues. She had dental issues that was giving her so much pain. She was trying to tear for all these kids. She was all alone. She was left alone. She was isolated. I mean, it was a really intense email. But the, the end, she, she drew us right up into the peace of God and this great spiritual truth. I'm gonna tell you something that was so powerful. I ended the sermon and I came down here and people flocked to me from our community. Here's my card, I'm a dentist. Here's my card, I have this. Here, I can help with this. Here, do this here. Was it? Pretty soon we had 20 people. I had to tell people, it's okay, I think we have enough. What is that? What is that? That's the profound love and mercy of God coming around someone in the community and saying, guess what? I know the work we have to do. We have to come around and live out Matthew 25 because that's the work that we are. When we have the mercy of God in us and the love of God in us and the authority of God in us, guess what? Hey, I can go. I'll go to the market. I'll do what needs to be done because there's a lot of work to be done in the kingdom of God. You know, I've told this story a number of different times because of fa- one of my favorite Mother Teresa stories. Mother Teresa just did incredible work in Calcutta, India, in the poorest of the poor. But someone was shadowing her one day, a businessman, and he was walking around with her. And one of her sisters came in and said, Mother, Mother, there's, some, there, there's a boy dying on the streets. And so she runs out and goes down the street and sees this boy and she picks up the body of this limp boy that's, that's, that's struggling. And she turns around and she's very little. And she turned around and this guy that had been shouting her was right behind and she said, get out of my way. I'm carrying the body of Christ. Do you realize that when we care for people, it's as if, and that's what I love about Mother Teresa, it's as if you're holding and caring for the actual body of Christ. Do you realize the privilege of that? If we could grab hold of that vision that God is giving us in Matthew 25, the ones that cared for the other, that opened up their lives, their resources, their energy, their capacity to help others were the ones that inherited the kingdom of God. This is a good news. And next what? It's not optional. If you follow Jesus, it's not optional. It's part of the work that we do. And as people of God, we actually experience the kingdom here when we serve those around us, especially the most vulnerable and the weak and the marginalized and the in need and the lonely and the imprisoned. By doing these acts, we are actually living this out. A couple of weeks ago, I, I got the privilege to interview and, and hang out with Ramesh Sapkota. And, and some of you know that Ramesh is our partner that does incredible work in Nepal, pushing against human trafficking of the vulnerable women in that community. But he wasn't always a Jesus follower. He was, he was a Hindu that had an incredible encounter with Jesus. And when he had that encounter, it shifted his life. And he tells this unbelievable story of the first woman he ever rescued, this young girl. And she, she, by the time he got her out of the brothel and brought her home, she had AIDS. She ended up dying of that disease. And as she was dying, she said to him, I have a daughter and her name is Pinky. Will you find her and rescue her? And he said, it was in that moment that God said, this is your mission for your life. And he said, I've been searching for pinkies ever since. He said, I never found that original daughter, but all the ones I find, they're my pinkies. Isn't that amazing that this man that had, why would you step into, I asked him that, why would you ever step into this? His family has been threatened. He's had to move across the world in different places. People in his family have been taken by the traffickers. I mean, it's just been this intense ride. He said, why, something compels you. And I told him, I said, the more I think about you, Ramesh, because he's a good friend. I've been to Nepal three times. I've watched people get rescued. He's unbelievable. I said, there's something that compels you. And this is the scripture that came to me that I shared with him, 2 Corinthians. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that Jesus died for all and therefore all died. And Jesus died for all so that those who live, listen to this, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Jesus who died for them and was raised again. And then here's the section that I kind of never really grabbed onto. So from now on, Once you have an experience with Jesus and you've given your life to Jesus, we regard no human being from a worldly point of view. What is he saying? He's saying, when you really have Christ in you, I look at you and you're my sister in Christ. You're Christ. I'm I'm, I'm seeing you from a whole different point of view. That's powerful. 
That changes the world. And Jesus says, this is our work. So God helps those who help themselves. Well, there is work to do. And part of that work is for those who cannot help themselves, God says, I want to have my community step in and do the work. That's what you're called to. What a privilege that is. How amazing is that? So God helps those who cannot help themselves through his people. Say through his people and by his grace. By his grace is the second one. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Before I do that, uh, we're going to receive our offering. So if you've come prepared to give, beautiful. If you're brand new here, this does not have to be your moment. If you want to take part, we welcome you into it. It's great. And what you're investing in is exactly what we're talking about. We believe, Matthew 25, we believe we need to be the hands and feet tangibly to our community. Whether it's here, regionally, around the country or world, we want to be tangible hands and feet. That's why we partner with people like Ramesh. That's why we do a marathon and run for people we may never meet. And that's why we do Thanksgiving baskets. We want to be tangible in our community. So that's what we're investing in. But more importantly, uh, for me and for Amy, uh, this is our time to say, Lord, thank you. (laughs) Thank you for what you've given. We want to invest in this community. So if you're part of that, beautiful. Those are the ways you can give. You can text the word Kensington to 77977. You can also uh, download our app and go to our website, uh, write a check, of course, and then uh, and then when you leave here, there's a beautiful box that someone made as we've been in the pandemic that you can drop something in, but we thank you for that. God helps those who cannot help themselves through his people and by his grace. The Apostle Paul says it so succinctly, and here's where I think things start to turn. This is where I'm hoping that we see a bigger vision about what this phrase truly means and how antithetical to the gospel and the good news and to the life of Jesus that that phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is really is so opposite of what God came to bring for all people. Listen to this in Ephesians 2. As for you, so now this passage is speaking to everyone in the seats and on stream and listening to my voice that is following Christ. If you're not following Christ, again, this is a beautiful thing to hear. We're we're speaking to people that are following Jesus. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sin and your brokenness in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, meaning that as we follow things that are not rooted in true life, which is God, it is going to lead to a form of death. And as we follow the things of God, it is ultimately going to lead to true life. And then it says this, but because of his great love, I heard a pastor say a lot of times, The Bible has a lot of big buts. This is one of them. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is not the gift. It is the gift of God, not your own gift not by your works, not by anything you do, so that no one can boast. This is probably the clearest example of the power of the cross and why Jesus came. There is no gift you can have other than Jesus and his grace. That is comes solely from Jesus. And that word grace is this unmerited favor, something you don't des- deserve, but you've been given anyways. Have you ever had that happen in your life where you've had a moment where You've done something and you deserve the wrath of somebody and they come at you and they give you the complete opposite. Have you ever had that moment? I've had that moment. What do you feel like in that moment? Thank God. Because I deserve this, but I'm getting this. This is this unbelievable grace that Jesus came to give. He said, here, I'm gonna give you a gift. You can't earn it. There's nothing in this world you can get it from. You can try and you can do all the good works. In the, in the particular uh, religious tradition I grew up in, it was always, what do I have to do to then gain favor of God? And now I realize there's no amount of work I can gain the favor of the Lord. It's only by this moment, it's bestowed upon us by Jesus. It is this gift of grace 
That as we place our belief in our faith in Jesus Christ, spiritually we were dead before, but now through this we are made alive. It is the grace of Christ and the work on the cross that makes us alive. And there's nothing we can do, nothing we can do, no amount of work to have this moment happen in our life. Only by placing our faith and our trust in Jesus can he pull us up into a whole new reality. So for 17 days, the Chilean miners are stuck in this little room, dark, no, very little rations, very hot. They have a little bit of water. They have some tuna fish. They have a little bit of milk. But they were doing their work, only the work they could do in this little space. You know what their work was? They rationed this stuff out, teaspoons or tablespoons at a time, knowing that they were going to try to gain as much time as they could, having no idea if they would ever be saved. And they rationed it out, and they were very disciplined. And they made it to day 17. Unbeknownst to them, there was a whole crew of people searching for them, looking for them, trying to find out where they were. They were on the surface, trying to figure out a way to enter into that space to bring them some sense of hope. And on the 17th day, they broke through this little space, and they sent a message down saying, we know where you're at. And by that way, they could send some messages, some different communications. They can give them what they needed. For 52 more days, they lived in that little space. They lived in that space while scientists and workers and men and women tried to figure out a way to drill down safely into that space, to send down something that could bring them up to the surface and restore their life. And 69 days later, the first miner hit the surface of this capsule that they made and he came up to the spot and it was re reunited with his community and all 3D, 33 Chilean miners were brought up to the surface and restored. I don't know if you were there that day in front of your TV, but I was. Do you remember it? They say over a billion people watched that. A billion people around the world looking at this unbelievable rescue of these 33 men, 19 to 69, pulled up after being in this little space for 69 days. Isn't that an incredible story? Why do I tell you the story? It's probably obvious at this point, maybe it isn't. Here is the very foundational truth of the Christian faith. I don't want you to miss it. There is not one person in the past, here in the present or in the future that can truly and eternally and overarchingly save themselves and help themselves. The very core of the Christian faith is God sent his rescue mission. His son was a reach and rescue mission down from heaven, down into the depths to what? Reach us here in our little tomb or whatever you wanna call this space and break through eternity to come close to his creation because he knew that we were trapped in a, in a pattern of sin and transgressions that we could never break without a rescuer. We can never get to the surface without the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so he said, I'm sending you the great reconciler. I'm sending you, you know why? Because you can't help yourself. And here's the real truth. No one, there's not one person that can truly help themselves. And so Jesus becomes the great equalizer. It's a great equalizer. That message of Christianity is so powerful because it makes the first last and the last first. It equalizes everything. It says, guess what? You may think you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but someday your breath is gonna stop. Someday you're not gonna have the resources. Someday you're not gonna have these things. You may have it now, but you may have to have it then. And there are people that are hurting around the world and there are people being oppressed and there are people being kidnapped like these missionaries in Haiti this morning. And there's all these things happening. And you know what God's saying? I wanna activate my community that's rooted in the truth and no one's better than anyone else. And the only real reconciler is Jesus Christ. And he's the one that helps all those that cannot help themselves, which by the way, is everyone. And now all of a sudden, the world looks a little different. Now all of a sudden, you are my equal sister, my daughter. I don't know, you look young, but you know, now all of a sudden we're a family. Now all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm caring for Christ because I've been compelled 
by a love that does not come from any source other than Jesus. I've been compelled and I've been filled with mercy that comes no other place other than Jesus. And now it changes. So God helps those who can't help themselves. It has nothing to do with the powerful message of the cross of Christ. You know, I was, last weekend I was at Man Camp. <laughs> I love the name Man Camp. And uh, I got to teach um, the last session on Saturday night. And then when we were done, York Moore came up and he gave a call to faith. He said, hey, anyone that has never heard this message before, would you put your faith in Jesus Christ? And we, we did the call for about 170, 80, 90 men. And about a dozen men just stood up. And the community immediately, without a word, came around them. And we just started, you know, praying. It was just a beautiful moment to watch men hand their life to Christ. And later, we got a text. And it was, it was a member of our Brazilian church who's meeting right now. And by the way, the Brazilian consulate of our country is in our building because they're coming here to serve our Brazilian community here. They're from Chicago. So I just got to meet the director there. So it's so cool how this message ties in with all that's happening. But... One of our members of our Brazilian church was there, a number of them, and his son came in from Toronto. And he had to fly from Toronto to somewhere else and then over to here because he couldn't drive. And, and this is a huge, long thing. And he got here and they drove all the way up to Spring Hill and they're part of this. But Saturday night was his night. And his father had been praying for years. Will my son give his life to Christ? Will he come to faith? And this young man, 30, 35 years old, dramatically comes to Christ and say, man, I have been in my own tomb. <laughs> I've been doing my own thing, lost in my own stuff. And God literally lifted him out. We went into the cafeteria. We came around him. He's just weeping. This beautiful moment. His father says, oh, this is the greatest day of my life. To see my son actually see. Now, here's what I, the question I want to ask you. When he goes back to Toronto, is Toronto ever going to be the same? <laughs> no. When his feet hit the ground in Toronto, he's been transformed. He's got the kingdom of God in him. He's got this vision to say, oh, wait, 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 wait. This is what God does to a heart and soul and mind? This is how it works? Okay, let me take this out to the community. Toronto's never gonna be the same with these young men. That's how it works. One pastor said, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He, make, he came to make dead people live. And he did it at a time that we didn't deserve. For while we were still helpless, at the very perfect time, Jesus died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps they would die for a good person. But God demonstrated his love towards us this way in that while we were still sinners, while we were still locked in that tomb, while we were still locked in our patterns of sin, while we were still moving away from God, he gave his life for us. Why? So that he could bore down into our lives, give us a hand and pull us up into new life. That is faith. That is the Christian faith. And that is a whole different ballgame. And so that phrase, I hope I never use it again. I hope I never use it again. And I hope when every time you hear that phrase, you think of this message, and you think of the truth of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do. We're going we're gonna to receive communion. Uh, the ushers are going to come down and give that to you here in the room. If you, if you need to get something at home, that'd be beautiful. And then I'm going to pray right now. And I'm going to pray for people in the room and on stream and they hear my voice that you've never given your life to Christ. It's a simple way to just say, Lord, I believe. And I'm also going to pray over us in the room. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done just in my own life, my family's life, uh, this community that we get to see over and over and over. Just the work you're doing is tremendous. Lord, I pray for the person in this room that came here not even realizing uh, the truth of what the gospel really means. They've been striving and trying to get themselves out of a hole for so long that they're weary. And it says, look, come to me. This is where you'll gain rest. Come to me. All you are weary, and I will give you rest. Lord, you're calling them to yourself. So if you're that person, it's really simple. Lord, you say, I believe. I believe in the gospel message. I believe, Lord, exactly in what has been said, that you came down from heaven in the form of humanity, that you walked the earth, that you went to the cross as a final sacrifice, that you would take on all of our sin of humanity, past, present, and future, onto yourself, so that anyone that would place their faith in you would have the resurrection power that happened three days after that, that you overcame even death in an empty tomb. And Lord, and when we place our faith in you, you rewire us, you change us, and you actually press us out into the community to have profound compassion and love and mercy. Lord, I believe that. It says, those that place their faith in Jesus Christ will never perish, but have eternal life, that you did not come to condemn humanity, but rather to save it. 
And so, Lord, I believe. I turn from my life now and I turn to you and I wanna walk in the ways of the kingdom. And for all in the room that maybe have said, hey, that Jesus is my center point of my life, but I have forgotten the power that exists in me, the power of mercy, the power of love and your authority and your grace. I've been walking in a different way. Lord, would you reorient my life? Would you press me deeper into you? Lord, would you reignite that fire? And would you have me see and actually step in to living a Matthew 25 life even this week? Ignite my faith, Lord. And for all those that are far from God that kind of wandered in here for ever different reasons and you have kind of your arms crossed spiritually, Lord, you are the one that draws. There's nothing in this place other than you and your spirit that draws people into your kingdom. And I would ask, Lord, that you continue to press someone towards the direction of your kingdom. And we know, Lord, that you're always drawing people near. Thank you for this time. We thank you for your scripture. We th- I, I deeply thank you for this community and the work you're doing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you can come down during this song.
Jesus gave this ritual to a small group of friends the very last time they had dinner together before he went to the cross. They had no idea what was actually really gonna happen. We can look back now and say, oh, some of this stuff makes sense. But at that time, they had no idea of what he was truly doing, what was truly gonna be coming forward. And so he said, I want this, I want you to remember this. And when we do this act, it's a remembrance. In fact, scripture says that when we take communion, we're declaring the truth of this until the return of Christ, meaning this is the truth, this is the way, this is the real life that exists in the person of Jesus. But he said, this is a piece of bread and this signifies my body that's going to be given up for you. Now, these things are a little odd if you haven't figured it out yet. There's this a very thin top that you have to take off to get the bread and then there's another one to drink the juice. But he said, this is bread and this represents my body that I'm going to display and give up for you. They would see this and understand even more so after this moment. But as we take this, realize what we just talked about, that Jesus went, even while we were sinners, and gave up all, his whole, for all people. Let's take it in that main. He also took wine, or we have juice, and he said, this is gonna signify my blood. It says in scripture that Jesus' blood poured out for all people, it washes you white as snow. Each time we come to Christ, it is a way for us to come to him and say, Lord, here's what I have. Here's in my tomb. Here's all the things that I have in my life. I give this to you. And it's representation of God washing over all people and making things new, which he's always in the process of transformation and making new. So as we take this, it's in thanksgiving. It's in a spirit of gratitude to say, thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus. We'll take it together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your profound sacrifice. Thank you for the idea that you flatten the curve, that you, that you make all people through faith in you worthy and part of a family. We thank you for that, Lord. And we want more of that vision. What does that look like? What does that look like to love our neighbors well, to love you well, Lord? And so continue to formulate in us individually and collectively. We thank you for this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last service, I got a text. People are watching. It's actually uh, Andrew Kim's wife, Robin. And she texts me and she says, hey, uh, when you mentioned that Christmas was close, uh, my kids started counting the days and they said, hey, we're going to make a, a paper chain about the days left for Christmas, you know. So they make this paper chain and as they're making it, they're making it and they're counting the days. All of a sudden it's quiet and Eliana, the daughter, says, hey, you know what? Those 69 days that it took for those Chilean miners to come to the surface, you know how long it is before Christmas? 69 days. They had this little thing. So I had them send a picture, 69 days, a good reminder of this idea of 69 days, we're gonna celebrate Jesus coming into the world to bring this restoration, this re reconciliation. In 69 days it took for these miners to brought into new life. That's what's available to us today. I thought that was so cute and such a great reminder. Uh, and so uh, as we sing this last song, we, and, we, and we really just sing it out, man, just, just be part of that. Sing these words out knowing that this is the truth that Jesus really brings into the world. Let's sing it together. In light of everything we've heard, the reality that we're invited to join Jesus on his mission, the reality that we can run to the Father, that we're invited into that relationship, into sonship and daughtership, it's all because of Jesus. It's all because one son was obedient and he welcomes us into that obedience and into that love. And so our response is just to say, thank you. So for the next three minutes that we have together, we're just gonna praise him and just say thank you and praise him for who he is. Because of his obedience, he was given the name that is above all names. So we're gonna declare that together as we end our time. Say, death could not hold you. The veil torn before you You silenced the boast of sin and grace Let's sing that again, death Death could not hold you The veil torn before you You silenced the boast of sin Oh, go ahead and say, death could not say, say well, death could not hold you
all that power is something we're invited into every day for those of us who are in Christ, the moment we believe. Today, maybe, maybe someone here online for the very first time, you said, you know, for the very first time, I believe. You're invited into all of that. You're invited into all of that love. You're invited into that belovedness. You're invited into the family. It's amazing, the power that's in the name of Jesus. Thank you guys for being here with us today. Just wanna remind you of a couple things. Don't forget about our Thanksgiving baskets. You can, you can find out more information out in the lobby or online. Also, if you need prayer today, we have some folks here who would love to pray with you. There'll be some people right down here, down front, or in the lobby, they would love to pray with you. Next week, we're gonna be talking about hashtag blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? Until then, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face or his presence to shine upon you. And may he give you his peace. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.